Hey everyone, DM Xavier here. I wanted to give one more quick shout out to my Twitch community for pushing me to begin this channel. I'm extremely excited to be able to bring all of my stories to life for you. If you enjoy the content on this channel, and in this video in particular, please click on the like button below, subscribe now, or at the end of the video when the link appears on the screen, and don't forget to slam that bell icon to ensure that you get all the notifications as soon as I upload new content. Without further ado, let's begin. Episode 1. The Journey Begins A volcanic ash-skinned tiefling woman with hair the color of sapphire and eyes of pure silver awoke on the crisp spring morning like she had so many other mornings before. The sound of the other orphans restlessly tossing and turning, refusing to get out of bed much like herself, was part of the regular routine. Eventually, she brought herself to getting up and preparing herself for the day. She begrudgingly trudged up the stairway and sat down for breakfast at the long stone table. Porridge, she thought. I'll have something better to fill myself with soon enough. As breakfast concluded, a stout, approximately 5 foot 5 inch, flabby bodied male dwarf with a long white beard and equally long hair woven with beads holding the all-too-familiar symbol of the dwarf father, Moradin, approached her. Brisis, he said as his long, slightly soiled robes rustled against her chair. I'd like to start by saying happy birthday to you, my dear. Unfortunately, you and I both know that today is your final day with the children of Moradin. Brisis sighed softly. Recalling all of the dreams she'd had over the last few years, where the music of adventure and notes of power flooded her mind, all the while a soft-spoken, veiled female form guided her through her training. Thank you, Cleric Battlehammer, she replied. I'll gather my things and make for Helmkar. The priest smiled and patted her shoulder. We have a cake prepared for you. Take the day to gather your things and we'll see you off this afternoon." Brisa spent the remainder of her final day speaking with her fellow orphans, saying her goodbyes, and packing her few worldly possessions, which included a set of bagpipes, a hand harp, and a set of beautifully crafted purple and black entertainer's robes. That evening, the entire orphanage gathered together to celebrate the 18 years that Brisa had stayed with them, Telling tales of her natural talent for music, and her ability to inspire everyone around her with positivity and joy. High Cleric Durger Battlehammer led the final tune of Happy Birthday before walking her out to the courtyard, where a small wagon, two brown horses, and a brother of the clergy awaited her. He embraced her tenderly like that of a father seeing his daughter off to school, and bid her farewell and welcome back for a visit any time she'd like. The wagon rode through the night and out of the gently rolling hills of the western dwarven homeland before finally reaching the massive capital city of Helmkar. As they approached, Brisis noted the 60-foot-high, flawlessly crafted walls speckled with watchtowers chiseled into the shape of large, brooding dragon heads that overlooked the entirety of the Dwarven Kingdom. From each of the watchtowers protruded a single, ten-foot bronze tube, which was carved into the shape of projecting fire. Brisis' eyes widened. These must be the mighty dragon flamethrowers the cleric spoke of all these years. As she approached the main gate, the wagon stopped. The driver turned and told her that this was the end of the line for now. He handed her a small satchel with 20 gold coins in it and a small holy symbol of Moradin. Brisis thanked him, exited the wagon, and made her way inside. As Brisis wandered the streets of Helmkar, she quickly, though nervously, identified the layout of the city. Realizing that she needed to find work, and potentially housing, she began in Guild Row, knocking on the doors of each of the guilds looking for work. 
After numerous rejections, she was finally invited into the Brewers Guild where she met with a barely five foot tall, muscle-bound dwarven man with a belly-length black beard adorned with a single Iron Fist pendant at the end. The man introduced himself as Iron Fist, which became very apparent as he slammed his literal Iron Fist down onto the table in front of her. I run this operation with, uh, well, you get it, he joked, as she sat nervously staring at the iron cudgel that was attached to the stump of the man's arm. He told Bresus that a small shipment of one of his famous brews was bound for Grandhelm but never returned. He stated that he'd had some trouble with local gangs attempting to steal the recipe, and fears that his wagon may have been waylaid. Bresus happily signed the contract that he provided, and was told to return the next morning where she'd be partnered with Iron Fist's own son in order to carry out the investigation. Bresus left and headed for the Laughing King Inn, where she managed to convince her way into openly performing for the local dwarves. Bresus filled her bagpipes to the brim and matched its near flawless sound with strings of yodeling as she regaled the patrons with old folk songs and dances. By the end of the evening, Bresus had managed quite a profit as her music was a huge success. It was so much of a success that she was actually offered a permanent place to sleep as well as an open invitation to come back and perform any time she wished. The next morning, Bresus gathered her belongings and made for the Brewers Guild, where she met with Iron Fist's son, a spitting image of his father though clearly 40 years younger. From there, they headed out of the city and to the east, along the main road that spanned the distance from Helmkar to Grandhelm. Roughly five miles outside of the city gates, where the hills began to become dotted with ancient pines, some standing as tall as 150 feet, Bresus noticed something in the road. She approached and picked up what appeared to be a small scrap of wool clothing, perhaps a cloak. Fastened to it was the tiny emblem of a copper-colored nail bent almost completely in half. Bresus looked at the boy she'd been traveling with. A sigil or rune of some sort? The boy replied, No, this is the insignia of the Rusty Nails Thieves Guild. They're not much more than bandits and brigands, but they must be nearby. The two nodded to each other before moving north from the road, spotting a set of dwarf-sized footprints in the dirt. Another hour had passed and the tracks had long been lost before Bresus noticed the familiar scent of campfire smoke somewhere nearby. She and the boy began to move as quietly and quickly as possible for the source. Eventually, they happened upon a small collapsed tower, one that, judging by its architecture, had been around since the time of the first happening. Bresus addressed the boy. Let's flank the door. Someone's clearly home and we haven't seen a soul since we left Helmkar. This must be where they're operating. The boy nodded, and they moved forward. As the two began to take up positions, the door suddenly swung open, and a rough-looking dwarf with curly brown hair and ragged leather armor appeared. Hey! What the hell is this? He shouted at the two intruders. Bresus looked down and noticed the small pin adorned to the leather on his right breast. You happen to know anything about a missing Brewer's Guild shipment? Didn't quite make it to Grand Helm, so it seems? Odd to see the rusty nails operating in these parts. Or is it? The bandit's jaw dropped as he looked at Bresus. He slowly reached for a short sword at his side and drew it from its sheath. Bresus noticed a second shadow in the doorway behind the man and began moving forward. The boy followed suit as he unslung his warhammer from his back. In an instant, Bresus breathed in deeply, so much so that her chest expanded to an unnatural state. As she reached the perfect distance, she flashed a series of quick arcane gestures with her right hand and exhaled with a massive burst of thunderous yodel. A shockwave ripped across the two bandits, knocking them off their feet and into the partially collapsed tower. 
As Brisis began to draw the short bow from her back, the boy sprinted ahead and into the doorway, where he performed a two-handed overhead swing onto the man below him, destroying most of the top of his skull and sending his body into convulsions. A third figure, which had been lying in wait, jumped out from the shadows and buried his short sword into the back of the boy, who dropped his warhammer and slumped forward in a silent and slightly twitching heap on the ground. The sound of an arrow being loose rang out. Brisis shot true as the man who just murdered the son of Iron Fist now lay in his own bloody pool in the interior of the tower. Brisis rushed inside, glancing around quickly for other signs of bandits. Thankfully, the room appeared empty. Groaning could be heard from the ground in front of her. She looked down and noticed that not only was the furthest bandit still alive, but so was Iron Fist's son, though he was on death's door. Brisis quickly stopped the bleeding and bandaged the boy up before walking over to the still breathing and now whimpering bandit. The bandit looked up at her through blood-soaked eyes. She looked down at him, now completely emotionless, and said, Where is Iron Fist's shipment? The dwarf looked past the bard into a small alcove in the tower before nodding. Brisis glanced quickly and noticed three intact barrels. You're lucky. Who do you work for? Brisis asked. The dwarf smiled, blood spilling out from between his teeth. Piss off, demon blood. The dwarf spat at her. Brisis smiled, realizing that the man was on his way out, kicked his daggers and short swords away from him, and began searching the bodies while he faded away. Brisis relieved the thugs of their coin purses, a few daggers, and a strange iron symbol which appeared to be a partially skeletal hand, palm open, with a single eye in the center. Vecna? She said to herself. Why? She finished her pillaging before loading up a small cart with the three barrels she'd found, the still but barely living boy, and the loot that she had gathered from the scene. The return trip took almost three times longer than the outward trip, but thankfully she made it without issue. Brisis immediately rushed to the Brewer's Guild where she'd brought the boy inside. Iron Fist greeted her and sent the boy downstairs to receive true medical attention. He thanked Brisis endlessly for returning his famous alcohol, Firebelly, though the concern for his own son was seemingly non-existent. It was with this that Iron Fist waved off the unholy symbol of Vecna, but suggested Brisa speak with the priests at the Temple of Moradin when she had time for more advice. He also offered her a partnership as a salesperson with the guild, which she happily accepted. It was with this accomplishment that Brisa took to the town once more, this time for some minor performances, a legitimate good night's rest, and inward reflection. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching this very first episode of Campaign 1, The Coalition of the Five, The Journey Begins. I am beyond excited to continue this project, and I am making it a personal goal to get at least two episodes out weekly until the campaign has completed. Again, if you enjoyed the content, or if you enjoy the channel as a whole, please feel free to hit that like button, drop a comment below, hit the subscribe button, and of course hit the little bell notification icon so that you can get up-to-date notifications as soon as I upload new content. Again, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time for Episode 2, A Holy Helping Hand.